So wow. it's one of the things that's important about out of this is that when you think that your life can't be any more <laughs> up and like it's gonna haunt you for the rest of your life, just remember George Washington. He literally started World War Zero. Um, <laughs> you, you know the fascinating he thing. He did okay. I, Welcome, everybody, to another episode of WTF History. This is the podcast where we go through two vignettes loosely tied together, and we ask you to tell us in the comments which of them blew your mind, which of them made you say WTF. Here is my lovely and talented co-host, David Quintana. Yes. These episodes are all great, and you want to be notified when the next one comes out. <laughs> Tell me you don't like my tie. Whatever it is, we just want to hear from you. Because I was on national TV just a minute ago. Um, <laughs> no, no, no. Okay, how about this? I was in my smoking jacket, uh, just lying around my house like this. There you go. Today, folks, we've got a really interesting episode because we're going to go over two times in history that people both call the first world war or the first true world conflict. They're at vastly different times in our history. And, you know, people have obviously said that about many conflicts over time, but these are two that we selected because of their ability to make you say WTF. One of the greatest misgivings that I have about education in high school history, I was never taught the seven years war. I think it was mentioned like they mentioned it, you know, and in 1754, started the, seven, the French and Indian War. Or the seven, by the way, the French and Indian War is the American, you know, North American version. Uh, and then Europe refers to it as the Seven Years War. But it's the same war. But that shows so the you. The war has an exonym and an endonym. <laughs> it's like, you know, the Greeks, we call them the Greeks, but they call themselves the Hellenes. It's like oh. the war has an official name. And uh, yeah. Like people call me a <laughs> but I call myself David. <laughs> <laughs> like does that count? Well, the Seven Years' War or the French and Indian War here, to me, is one of the absolute most important wars. The vocabulary of our Revolutionary War was discovered and written in the in the French and Indian War. The heroes of the Revolutionary War, like, proved their mettle and learned their lessons in the French and Indian War. The boundaries that were created, right, came out of the French and Indian or the Seven Years' War. Um, England, out of the Seven Years' War, that's when they really became the empire that we know them as because um, – or that we remember them. <laughs> Sorry, English people. That we remember <laughs> them as. Ouch. Um, hey, don't oh, worry. God. People are going to be saying that shit about America too. Upset Englishmen <laughs> commenting in the YouTube. But that's uh, – the Seven Years' War is how they gained um, control over India and Canada. So anyway, that is how important it is. But what's interesting is how it started. In 1754, the French had been in the United States for about 150 years. Isn't that funny? Because we we kind of telescope time and it's like Plymouth Rock, Revolutionary War. And it's like, no, dude, there was like 150 years. Um, so the French had been in America since like 1600. But even then, they only had like 75 to 80,000 colonists in in North America. The British, on the other hand, had about 1.5 million. Uh, I don't know about you doubt. Life is good in France. We, <laughs> we want wine. to keep them out. Yeah. <laughs> but, but what the French had was they had control of the superhighways because they controlled the rivers and the rivers were the superhighways of the time. What England had were the people on the East Coast. And over that 150 years that I mentioned, the British kept going to the West, to the West, to the West, past the Appalachians, and they started meeting the French who were in the middle. So the French had everything from the Great Lakes down to Flo down to New Orleans. And the British kept coming over, coming over. So it was only a matter of time before these two great world empires, the French Empire and the British Empire, met. And in 1754, that came to a head. Um, so the governor of Virginia, Dinwiddie, decided, you know, hey, they had formed something called the Ohio Company. And the Ohio Company was a company that went all the way to the west, in, to, to the Mississippi. And the Ohio Company... 
because all of that was referred to as the Ohio Valley, by the way. I want to make this clear. The Ohio Valley was that area south of the Great Lakes, down those rivers, the Ohio, the Mon Monongahela, the Allegheny, all of those rivers through Pennsylvania and Ohio. And George Washington's family, they were investors in the Ohio Company. The governor was an investor in the Ohio Company. And all of these wealthy Virginians were investors in the Ohio Company. And the Ohio Company wanted to keep going to the West and they wanted to sell this. They wanted to be land speculators. But, so Dinwiddie said, hey, you know, officially, we need to get out there and we need to see what the French are doing because we hear that they're building forts, you know, down the Mississippi. And the French were because they had been hearing that the Brits kept coming to the left and these settlers were starting to create farms and clear lumber, clear timber. So they're like, we well, need to get out there. And then Dinwiddie is like, oh, uh, you know, he found a young lieutenant colonel or a young major, 21 years old, by the name of George Washington. George Washington himself, before he was 21, he had done surveying out there. So he kind of knew the lay of the land. So he got George Washington to go out there and he said, I need you to take this letter to the French and tell them, hey, if you're building this, you guys need to leave, right? This is this is British territory. And did what he was like, oh, and why don't you build a road? Well, you're going out there. Well, but, the but remember, Washington, if I remember correctly, was a surveyor. Mm -hmm. That's that was his profession, right? He was trained as a surveyor in yeah. addition to being a gentleman farmer, right? So I'm going to skip over a lot of these things, but the journeys out and back are full books in themselves. And because you got to remember, he's going through virgin forests and it's really rough land and it's really hot and it's really cold. And it took him like almost a year to get out there. So Washington gets out there, he finds the French, and indeed they are building they are building forts, and he gives them a letter from, you know, Dinwiddie, and he says, hey, if you're building forts, you better stop, because, you know, the Brits, we, we consider this our, our stuff. And the French are like, ha, 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 this is cute. And they were like, yeah, thank you, no. Uh, but they put Washington up for the night, and while he was there, he took notes and made sketches, right? And um, by the way, there's an Indian uh, by the name of Half King, uh, Mingo tribe, and he plays a large role in this all over the place. He's also kind of mythical in what he does. Um, but at best, he's a unreliable narrator. So he plays a very interesting role. But I want to mention him because he helped George Washington get out there. There were a lot of, uh, of Native Americans who helped him get out there. So he comes back and he reports back to Dinwiddie, hey, yeah, they're building a lot of forts. The French are, you know, fortifying this area, which they had, honestly, they had a right to because they considered it their land and they saw the Brits coming out. So Dinwiddie enlists a gentleman by the name of William Trent, and he makes him a, a captain. And he says, you need to go out to what they called the Forks of the Ohio. And that is now Pittsburgh. He tells Trent to go out there, build a fort at the Forks of the Ohio. And then he wants Washington go, to go up there and hold it and turn back or kill anyone that tries to interfere with the Brits. So William Trent goes out there, Captain Trent now. Um, again, they have to cut their way. The journeys are stories unto themselves. He gets out there. He starts building a fort on the Forks of the Ohio. And unfortunately for him, a huge contingent of French troops, about 800, they come down and they say, hey, thank you for starting our fort, Mr. Trent. We'll take it from here. And they kind of kick them out. And they, and they build a much bigger fort. And they call it Fort Duquesne, which is still there today. And it's awesome. where you hear Duquesne University. Sure. And that was named after the uh, the governor of the area, the French governor. You know, so Washington is like, oh, shit. okay. Well, you know, we need to... We need to keep going. There are many stories that will say that this Native American half king kind of pushed Washington to go out there and kept ed egg egging him on. You need to go out and take on these French. You know, they're going to get you first and all this kind of stuff, right? There are no primary sources, sources which say that. Um, from everything that I have found, it was really Washington and Dinwiddie were like, no, this is what we're doing. But I think in retrospect, what they tried to do was blame a lot of it on the Indians. And that will come up in a moment. May 27th, 19, 8, 1754, Washington is heading out there. And half, half King, who is the Native American we've talked about, the Mingo leader, he comes and he tells Washington, hey, you know what? We've seen a French contingent. They're coming out towards you. Like, I think we got to attack them first. Again, no no contemporary sources back this up, but this is what history now says, and I don't believe it. And sure. um, so, you know, Washington sends out a party of about 70 men. 
he had he had camped out at the Great Meadows. And so they're going to go find these Frenchmen. Right. And I think he also heard gunshots. They go in the night. It's early, early morning. And they come upon a group of about 31 French soldiers. Um, and they are sleeping in a, a little glen, a little a little hollow, which now is called Humonville Glen. D- d- again, the sources are all over the place. The fog of war, fog of history. What we do yeah. know is that after about 15 minutes, there are 10 dead Frenchmen and 21 wow. French prisoners. So and- in a weird way, Washington started this war. Yeah, well, it's worse because one of those, uh, one of the men who was killed, and there are two different ways that he was killed. Right? I mean, there's two different stories. One story, there's a gentleman there by the name of Joseph Colon de Villiers sur du Jumonville. He was actually an ambassador, a French ambassador. And his mission was to take a similar letter that Washington had taken, right, to, to the French, to the British governor. To say, hey, this is French land. Please don't build here. Could you guys leave? Right. And he had the letter. Um, <laughs> but Washington. So they literally killed the messenger. Basically. They literally killed the messenger. Oh, geez. And he was an ambassador. So what happened then? And now there is a story that is oft repeated. In fact, PBS has a documentary that says that Washington is talking to Yumonville. And he, while he is talking to him as a prisoner, that. Half King comes up behind him, hits him in the head, cleaves his skull with a tomahawk, and then washes his hands and his brains. This is in the PBS documentary. There is no evidence anywhere to say that was true. No contemporary uh, sources cite that. I fully believe after I've studied this pretty closely now, it was Washington and his guys that, you know, probably he was 21, remember? And he, he had a militia. He didn't have a trained army. And they probably did what they did, which was shoot. And it was dark, yeah. right? Yeah. So Jumonville is now dead. Washington realizes, I'm f***ed. So <laughs> Washington, one guy escaped, and the guy who escaped went back to the Fort Duquesne. So Washington goes, and he builds a fort called, I like the name, Fort Necessity. And it's like 50 feet by 50 feet. There's a storehouse in the middle. There's no roof, which is important. And the guy makes it back to the French, and the French are led by Humonville's brother, half-brother. And Humonville's half-brother is like, no, 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 I want this dude. I want to lead this contingent of, I think there's a total of 1,200 French troops um, and and Native American allies. And he's like, no, 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 uh uh-uh, this is me. I'm didn't, he killed my brother. And so he's coming down after Washington. Washington is like in Fort Necessity with his militia, right? Which is just a bunch of ragtab guys. And he's 21 years old. And they do get some reserves that were sent by Governor Dinwiddie, but they wanted nothing to do with Washington and his ragtag militia. So they slept outside of the fort because they literally wanted nothing to do. But they built breastworks, you know, which would allow them to shoot. And they had muskets. Important. Flintlock. Important. So they're waiting for the French. The French come. Strong, 1,200. Washington is in a meadow. It's surrounded by a forest. So the French are like, oh, yeah, okay, we'll hide behind the freaking trees. <laughs> and so the French are just pot-shotting the, the Brits, right, and Washington's ragtag militia, just taking shots at them all day long. Washington is rolling at the casualties. I think a total of three French died. You know, they probably died, like, shot themselves, right? Probably accident-friendly yeah. fire. Then a rainstorm starts, so their flint is, like, not worth now because they have no Ah, roof, and they're out in the open, so their muskets are, like, misfiring. Washington's ragtag militia, not the soldiers because they want nothing to do with them, they're inside Fort Necessity, again, greatly named, and they start hitting the alcohol. So his (laughs) troops are just getting drunk now because they're like, we're we're drinking. And out of nowhere, the French come out and say, parlez? And they have a white flag and they say, hey, parlay, like, you know, do you want to surrender? You want to talk? And Washington's like, oh, my God, I can't believe this is happening. I mean, I thought I was dead. And so they come out and they, you know, present their, you know, what they want. And essentially what they wanted was Washington just to sign something saying they take responsibility for the death of Humonville. Right. So Washington doesn't read or speak French. 
the surrender terms are in French. So he gets a guy, right, who can speak French. He was, I think he was Dutch. You guys can correct me if I'm wrong. And so Washington has him read it. But what he doesn't read correctly is that it says that Washington assassinated Chumonville. <laughs> There's a Jeez. difference in that. <laughs> right. So the terms he, sur- he signs say, yes, we surrender and we admit we assassinated Ambassador Humonville. And the French are like, Jeez. we're out of here now. Good luck on your trek back. And <laughs> um, while they're going back, they're getting picked off, right? That surrender letter becomes the evidence that the French needed to say that the Brits declared war on France by assassinating, not killing accidentally, assassinating, not in the fire, not in a firefight, but assassinating their ambassador. That then leads to the Brits coming back, right? Because they used Fort Necessity as saying, hey, these French attacked us, right? So now they're coming back and the entire Ohio Valley is now going to become the birth of the Seven Years War and the French and Indian War. A couple of things out of this. The world like now sees George Washington essentially as a fuck up. Like, honestly, there was a mythos around George Washington during that period as this young Virginian who started a war. So wow. it's one of the things that's important about out of this is that when you think that your life can't be any more f- up <laughs> and like it's going to haunt you for the rest of your life, just remember George Washington. He literally started World War Zero. Um, <laughs> you, you know the fascinating thing? He did thing okay. Is, I, I was actually thinking about how that is the parable to take from this. I That is very, very wise counsel because that's exactly what I'm getting out of the story is that this guy, man, his career did not start that great. Colossal screw up. But, you know, with enough time, you can rehab. You can rehab. The other thing out of this is that when when George Washington finally got back to Governor Dinwiddie and gave him all the reports, like, oh, yeah, we did this, we did that, you know, Fort Necessity, drunken soldiers. Um, He did that. Dinwiddie paid him 50 pounds, which was essentially just enough to cover his expenses for all that. That is one of the key reasons George Washington left the British military after the French and Indian War. And that's one of the reasons when war, when the Revolutionary War started, George Washington was a free agent. English statesman Horace Walpole had a, had a nice phrase about George Washington uh, on the Hamonville affair, which as it became, it came to be known, he, he described it as a volley fired by a young Virginian in the backwoods of America that set the world on fire. Wow. That one meeting in Schumonville Glen that night set the entire world on fire. I find that so fascinating and I wish they would teach this in schools. And I think it would make a great movie to be honest. Yeah, it would make a fantastic movie because here you have the current boundaries of America, Canada, things like this being at the mix. Uh, vast quantities of the country, whether they're going to speak French or English. Right. Uh, the the treatment of Native Americans, uh, which the French in many ways got along with, but the British were a little harsher on. I mean, these are, you know, and of course, the rehabilitation of our iconic founding father, George Washington. I mean, this is a fascinating story. And this is, you've done this two weeks in a row now. This is a <laughs> second thing that I knew nothing about. And again, folks who don't know, I studied history as well. And all these, I mean, I love history and I knew nothing about this episode in American history. Yeah. Anyway. All right, Mike, what do you got? Okay. So today we are going to talk about one of the, you know, another rival for the title of the first world war or world war zero. And my thing, of course, and the, the jokes can start, we're going back to classical history today, back to Greek and Roman times, but we're not talking about Greeks and Romans in many ways. We're talking about the Goths. And the first thing I want to say, and David knows this is that when a lot of people think about the Goths, they think about Gothic architecture, Gothic music, Gothic style. The Goths have nothing to do with any of those, right? Really? <laughs> they had nothing to do. The, the, the Goths do not have black eye makeup and black hair. <laughs> are you kidding are, me? The, the Goths are a tribe of Germans. They're a Germanic tribe that uh, w- one of the original Germanic tribes. They're an East Germanic tribe. Uh, they probably had lots of blondes and uh, they lived in modern, uh, what was then Scandinavia. And uh, all these references came much, much later in time. So you got to go back to r- roughly the start of the modern era, roughly the year zero in the modern calendar. 
the Goths are living in what we believe to be, um, they have a sort of a Baltic centered state. Some of the Goths are living in southern Sweden, which is to this day called Gotland. And some of them are living in northern Poland and northeast Germany. Um, but they're centered in this Baltic area. And for many, many years, for decades, in fact, uh, they had a period of massive prosperity. And the prosperity in southern Sweden, and you guys are going to laugh, was simply caused by you know, a roughly 50-year period of very, very warm weather. Uh, we know, scientists know from studying the bark of trees and things like that, that they had a long period of warm weather, uh, freakishly warm weather. And, and what did that mean back then? It didn't mean that people were basking in the sun. It just meant that their crops yielded a little bit more. And the crops yielding a little bit more meant that the women had a few more babies. And a few more babies meant that they had a bigger population and they could take on neighboring tribes and so on and so forth. But the problem was that that 50 year period of massive prosperity was followed by 50 years of horrible cold. Right? It's sort of like a mini ace, ice age, you know, climate change, we would call it today. But at some point, the Goths as a people said, we're out of here. So the Goths, the Goths, they actually, they burn their villages. They say, we never want to come back to this land. They burn their villages. They cross the Baltic. And now they go down into modern Central Europe, right? They're wandering through Germany. They're wandering through Poland. Uh, they're looking for a new homeland. And this is a massive group of people. This is a nation state of refugees. And after decades of wandering, they finally settle to a place that's in the news today, which is the modern Crimean Peninsula. Uh, they settle in modern day Ukraine. It's got a mild climate for them. It's beautiful. Um, they grow crops again. They're very peaceful. And, and people find this so hard to believe with what happens next in history with the Goths. They view them as marauding Vikings, right? So they settle in they settle in modern day Ukraine, but at some point they wake up in the morning, they're looking east, and here is a gigantic tribe of they estimate between 30 and 100,000, yep, mounted men on horse who had originated at the border between, you know, that that nebulous area of Asia where Siberia, Mongolia, China, Korea, the Huns. And the Huns were immensely skilled horsemen. Uh, they could ride across the Great Plains using it as a super highway. Uh, they were just, they lived on horses and they drove the Goths out. So now the Goths, where they've got this tradition of wandering, they've got to wander again. And so what do they do? The same thing that refugees do today. They present themselves at the doorstep of the superpower at the time, and they beg them to come into their country. So they come to the border of the Roman Empire and they say, hey, guys, we've left two lands like we're kind of desperate can we come into the roman empire and just settle here we'll work we'll do whatever please let us in and the romans initially say no uh, you cannot come into the roman empire we can't absorb this many refugees sorry but finally there's an emperor who's fairly nice and this empire this emperor says yes we will make room for you in the roman empire We've got some free land in Pannonia. And again, if, if I'm wrong on this, correct me, but we've got some free land, you can come on in. And he's a decent fellow. And, and he says, I'm gonna appoint my buddy, the governor, and he's gonna take care of you. So the Goths cross the border into the Roman empire. They settle. It's a bunch of unemployed guys who are desperate. I mean, you guys know the themes, plus their wives and their families. And the emperor thinks, hey, I've solved this crisis and I've done a good deed. And he pats himself on the back. I've cared for these families. There's only one problem. The governor who he appointed to be in charge of this Gothic settlement is a total f He is just the biggest rapacious dad. And he basically says to the Goths, you know what, we're gonna pen you in. We're not gonna just let you settle, we're gonna pen you in. And then he says, I know there's about 100,000 of you in this pen, but if you want food, you can purchase it from me. And, you know, so, so for the first, you know, few months, the Goths are spending their stores of gold and silver. Honestly, Boy, that yep. sounds like what happened out West with the Native Americans, yes. right? Where, yes. where they put them under yeah. the uh, auspices of the army, right? And the army yep. would have some crooked dude in charge and like, yeah, you're all going to yep. live in here and you can buy from my store over here. Yep. Yeah, kind of the similar thing. These, these themes are unfortunately as old as humanity itself. At some point they run out of resources and they say, look, we got nothing else to give, but you got to feed us. I mean, the Roman emperor said you take care of us. And he says, no, you haven't run out of resources. You can still sell your kids into slavery. 
Like, you know, like just sell your kids into slavery and, and we'll, we'll pay for the other kids. Oh, so God. some of the goths do that and they're just, it's a miserable existence. But at some point, the gothic men get very, very pissed. They just, they're like, hey, I'm not selling my kids into slavery anymore. And the key thing is that this location where they were was right next to a Roman armory. So these guys went in unarmed, but they're very, very close. And they know that if they take over this armory, they've got the latest in weaponry. And you have to understand the Roman weaponry, right? This would be like right now, a group of unarmed refugees breaking into a place where the army keeps its Kevlar vests and it's, you know, grenade launchers and stuff like that, right? So these Gothic men, they overpower the Romans at the Roman armory. And now they've got swords and shields and crossbows and the latest in military technology. And they're starving and they're pissed. So they just start marauding. They're like, all right, game on. And they just go all around the Roman Empire. They go to Athens, they pillage it, they destroy it. I mean, and they can't be talked reason to now. It's like, well, you guys mistreated right. us for so long. Right. Like, screw you, right? And they have not forgotten this slight. And you you fast forward a little bit now to uh, to 378 AD. Um, they're still now marauding in the Balkans, Greece, near the border of modern Turkey, in that area. And the Roman emperor is like, hey, I got to do something about this. So he goes out there and he's like, okay, I'm going to kick these guys, but gosh, we're going to defeat them once and for all. But this is a time in the Roman Empire where there's uh, empire where there's two, three different em emperors at the time, co-emperors, and they're kind of jealous of each other. They don't want to share glory. So make a long story very short. One emperor does not want to wait for the relief forces of the other emperor to come and meet him at the battle. He takes on the Goths by himself and the Goths defeat him and kill him. The first time that a Roman emperor has ever been killed in battle against a hostile um, force. You go forward a couple generations and it's now 410 AD and the Roman Empire in the West is kind of on life support. And uh, there is a great king of the Goths named Alaric. Mm. Um, for those who have watched mm -hmm. our episodes before, you know that Rick is just a Germanic root word that means king. Alaric, Alaric, king of all. That's what was his <laughs> name, the king of all. Uh, very simple. He comes from Gothic nobility. They can trace their way all, all the way back to Sweden. They've led them through all these wanderings. And he's like, you know what? We've taken Athens. We've taken Adrianople. Hey, it's time to go for the biggest thing of all, which is Rome itself, right? So... He comes down to Rome. Again, we're going to make a long story very short. Uh, one time he's talked out of taking Rome by the Pope. The second time, he, you know, he, he's just done with Roman perfidy. And in 410 AD, um, the, the Goths sack Rome. Um, first time Rome has been taken for 700 years. They sack it, they destroy it, or some of it, you know, it still exists. Um, at some point, he, he, the Romans get them to stop the fighting. He says he wants, you know, pounds of gold, tons of silver, all your purple vestments, all these spices. And the Romans say, what will he have left? And Alaric says, your lives. <laughs> and he, he has all this booty from Rome, including, and this is fascinating for people who are into this, he has the Ark of the Covenant. Mm. He has all of these Roman war spoils that, that they have taken from all these historical places. And he starts marching down the Italian peninsula because the Goths are finally going to settle in North Africa. That's their dream, right? They're going to find a nice warm place where they can farm and in peace and everything like that. He's walking down the, the Italian peninsula. He gets to a province called Cosenza. He gets this powerful man, fluke of history, gets bitten by a mosquito. As a Mormon, he does not have the, the uh, resistance to malaria that many Mediterranean people have. He dies. And what do the poor Goths have to do? They're now without a king. Their leadership is gone. There's some political fights. They keep wandering. So th if you're following, they went from South Sweden to Northern Poland, to the Crimean Peninsula, to like modern day Hungary, like Austria, down to, Ro or I'm sorry, down to Athens, down to Turkey, all the way back to Rome, down to Southern Italy. And now they go all the way up to modern day France. <laughs> They're like, we got to find a place to live. This is crazy. This is crazy. They settle in modern day France. Finally, they can take a deep breath. They just go back to farming. We just want to be that left That's kind of alone. a big circle, man. <laughs> we just want to be left alone. But now you have the start of our thing, which is the world war that starts. Okay. So now it's just a couple of decades later. It is 455 AD. And uh, the Huns have not stopped at, you know, pillaging the Eastern parts of the Roman empire. Now they're knocking on the door of Italy and Rome. So 
So anyway, the Huns are now pressuring Rome itself. And on top of that, there's a plague. A plague hits the Roman Empire. And it's, folks, it's worse than COVID. It's worse than, it's almost as bad as the bubonic plague. They're not really sure what it was, but they think it was a, a instance of the Black Plague before it actually had come back during, during medieval times. And so you've got massive depopulation in, in Rome and Italy. So there's this great leader. And ironically, he's half Roman, half Gothic. His name is Flavius Aetius. And he's sitting in Rome and he's like, crap, there's... 30 to 100,000 mounted warriors coming to invade Italy, coming to invade Gaul, coming to invade the Roman Empire. And I've got one legion. I've got 5,000 Italian veterans sitting here in Italy. That's it. Everyone else is dead. Uh, we don't have the money to pay them. What are we going to do? Right? So he's like, well, I'll go raise another legion. But he goes through Italy and all he can muster is one more legion. And many of these guys aren't even Romans. They're another random tribe called the Alans that had, that had come there. So he's got one crack legion of veterans and one really awful legion of militia. And he's going to face 100,000 mounted warriors that have conquered everything from like Mongolia right. to, to Italy, right? So he's like, who can we go to who really, really hates the Huns? And he's like, okay, uh, the Goths. <laughs> and they're like, dude, you're nuts. You can't go. The Goths, they hate the Romans. Yeah, yeah, right. You right. can't control them. So he goes up to Gaul and he's like, hey, I know you, you all settled peacefully here. You know, could you do me a favor? Could we unite to go kick the Huns' butts? And surprisingly, the Goths say yes. You've got these people who hated each other, the Goths and the Romans. Hey, they had been at war for a hundred years and they say yes. And so they actually know where the Huns are headed. They had got some primitive intelligence and except the Huns along the way, they had picked up all the enemies of Rome at the time. They had picked up the Saxons and all these other random tribes that had an ax to grind with Rome. <laughs> so, so the Romans set up in this place called Catalonian Plains, right? And Aetius does this brilliant strategy. He knows that the Huns, they have this very, uh, it's still taught at West Point today, a certain military tactic where they, um, they fight in a, in a pincer movement and they basically attack the weakest point of the center of the line. And then they come through and they, they do this like reverse enveloping technique. So what does Aetius do, do? He hides the goth, the Gothic army on one side in the forest. And he hides the crack Roman legion in the forest on the other side. And in the middle of this little valley, he puts the militia, the guys who are like, that he had just this ragtag band of Alans and some Northern Italians that he had raised on the way to Gaul. And he's like, oh, you know, hi Huns, like charge right through here. Now, meanwhile, the guys, and, and by the way, I'm diminishing the number of nations, of primitive nations that, that, uh, that fought in this battle. Literally on either side of this battle was every single modern European nation or their predecessors was on this. There were Gauls, there were Celts, there were Huns, there were Goths and Saxons and Anglos. Lombards? And Lombards, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I mean, literally Burgundians, every tribe you can imagine is on one of these battles. But what's really key here is that the Huns, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're ready. They're facing each other. And, you know, on one side, you've got Aetius talking to the Romans and he says, guys, let's not forget we're the mother Roman empire. Like <laughs> this stuff stops here. And he gets his 5,000 guys in a fury. And on the other side of the forest, the Goths are like, you know, you got their King. And he's like, we're the Goths. Like we've been kicked out of Sweden. <laughs> we've been kicked out of Poland. We've been kicked out of Crimea. We've been kicked out of Rome. Like this stops here. Right. And so the guys on each side were almost in a superhuman fury. So what happens, it goes exactly as planned. The Huns charge the middle. They kind of trapped in this valley. And then the guys who are worked up in a fury from either side come down and they destroy them. Oh. I mean, literally like the Huns ceased to be a nation at this battle. It was brutal. Um, the crazy story is, you know, obviously we haven't gone into the Gothic leader. His name was Attila. A few days later, one of his slave girls poisoned him. Oh, no, you mean the, the Hun leader? I'm sorry, the, the, the Hun, Hun leader, leader was yeah. Attila. Misspoke. And this pretty much ends the Hunnic threat. So, and the, the, West, so, the Western Roman Empire would continue for another couple of So was he, because I've also heard that he just drank himself to death. So you think it was poison? Yeah, I mean the the best the best story which has come down to us is that you know he had a slave girl from one of the many nations he had conquered, 
her dad, her brothers had died a horrible death and, you know, she had access to his drinking and she somehow poisoned okay. him. You know, either is possible, but to me, it is fascinating, just mm -hmm. fascinating that for about 200 years in European history, you had this weird Gothic Roman Hunnic, mm -hmm. you know, like uh, yeah. these were the, the China, Russia and United mm -hmm. States of the day. And it was really fascinating how much culture they borrowed from each other. Uh, there was a, uh, you know, Attila had taken a Gothic name. That's actually a Germanic name. It's not a, a Hunnic name. And uh, later you have a Gothic look. A gothic leader who called himself Totilla, uh, <laughs> and 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 it, and what's most fascinating to me is that you know this battle was fought in 455. It's one of the main reasons why the Roman Empire kicked around for a little bit more in the West. But 150 years later, in like the 550s, you know, uh, 570s, you still have you still have the Goths and the Rome, Romans battling it out for control of Italy and control of Spain and and how it. This, but this really was a fascinating story because when people go back and they think about the Goths, it is only taught what a powerhouse they were and how they ended up ruling Spain and Italy yeah. roughly 500, 600 AD. But nobody teaches that really they were refugees. They were people, they just wanted a farm. I did not they just that. wanted to be left alone and they got messed with by the great powers. And at some point they became a great power. They're like that movie character who just wants to have that farm out on the prairie. You know what I mean? <laughs> right. And like the bad yeah. guys keep with them yes they keep poking yes. them he's like i just want to be a gentleman farmer you yes need to leave <laughs> of the the, yes. the gentleman scorned right and he comes yeah. back and that's the goths right they're that character and we'll close with this i mean you guys have heard us say this so many times treat people well that's a theme in so many of the historical vignettes we say but this is a lesson for the great powers which is treat the refugees well right at some point you could push them too far and they will be a lot more disruptive than you think they are when they show up on your doorstep. Yeah, today. but that was a good story. I had no idea about that. No idea. And I didn't realize that that was Attila that was involved in there. Um, yeah. So great story, Mike. That is a really, really good story. I had no idea about the goths. We'll have to do another show sometime about why the goths have so much shit named after them. It's really amazing. <laughs> you know, there's it's no so like true. Lombard fa uh, font. There's no, that's a great that's piece. True. Of, At least that we know. Of. That's a great piece of Lombard, Lombard architecture. architecture. Yeah. Hey, you guys, you know, give us a like, subscribe, uh, get into the comments and tell me where I effed up and praise Mike for his mastery of the facts. Um, <laughs> but thank you, Matt. Mike, anything? Mike? That's it. Thank you, everybody. Thanks for listening. Yeah. Thank you. Hey, if you like what you hear, like and subscribe. It really means a lot, and we would love to have you coming back every week. Thank you.